This multi-part question is beautiful because it ties together many of the principles outlined in this chapter. It begins by discussing a solution of 100 milliliters of this concentration KOH being mixed with a solution of 200 milliliters of this concentration of nickel sulfate. It then asks part A, write the bounce chemical equation for the reaction that occurs. Part B, what precipitate forms? Part C, what is the limiting reactant? And part D, how many grams of the precipitate form? So let's put this all together. As we've learned in our precipitation videos, which I'll link to floating over my head or in the description below. The general format we want to follow for our reactants is a partner swap, where we have reactant AB being combined with reactant CD, and then they just swap partners, A going with D and B going with C, cat ion to anion. How do we translate that to this? What part is the A and what part is the B? Well, potassium is our cat ion in this formula, so that is my A. Hydroxide being one of the polyatomics shown right here that you definitely want to memorize is by itself our B. Over here, nickel is our metal, so that is going to be our C. And sulfate, another of the polyatomics that you should memorize, is our D. So what I'm going to initially do is just have them swap partners. K, my A, will go with sulfate, my D. And nickel, my C, will go with hydroxide, my B which I've written in this way to give us a little bit of room. Now I realize the formulas on the right are not completely correct, at least not yet, but this is the way I initially begin it. We now want to make sure that all of our charges are matched properly in order to get the formulas correct on the right hand side. Potassium being in column one of the periodic table will always have a plus one charge as a cation. So I'm just gonna make note of that here. Now please keep in mind when you write these formulas, you do not officially write charges over them unless they're separated ions. Instead, I'm just writing them up here for bookkeeping purposes. Hydroxide is a polyatomic we should memorize. We should know has a negative one charge. So I'm gonna write just a negative one right there and right there. Now nickel is a transition metal, which means that it could potentially have multiple different charges depending on the circumstance. So how do we deduce its charge? By picking it from the sulfate. Sulfate being a polyatomic we should memorize has a negative two charge. And again, because this is not a redox reaction, my charges will carry over exactly the same they are not gonna change, so I have sulfate over here. Because the nickel here in this formula goes together one to one with the sulfate, in order to cancel out a negative two charge, what charge must the nickel have? Yeah, it's got to be a positive two. Now that I know all of their charges on the right, do we see any problems? Obviously, I cannot have a plus one potassium cancel out a minus two sulfate written like that. What do I need to do? Yeah, I need to have two potassiums in the formula, and I do that by adding a subscript. So now I have two potassiums, each of which have a plus one charge, together combined, give you in toto a plus two, which will cancel out the minus two in the paired sulfate. Similarly for the nickel, with its plus two, is not going to get canceled out charge-wise by the minus one from one hydroxide. So what do I do? I need two hydroxides. Now because hydroxide as an entity has two atoms in its formula, how do I indicate that there's two of them? I have to encase it in parentheses in the formula and put a subscript of two. Now I have two hydroxides, minus one each, in total is gonna give me a charge of negative two, which will cancel or bounce out that positive two in the nickel in my formula. Now I'll go ahead and erase my charges. Which again, I really only put there for bookkeeping purposes. In order to get my final equation here correct, I also need to bounce the equation. Once we get to this stage where we have all of our formulas correct here, I cannot change any of the subscript numbers. Those are fixed. I'm only allowed to add coefficients. For example, here on the left, I've got one potassium, but on the right, I have two. So what do I do? I'm gonna add a two coefficient right there. That multiplies through giving me two hydroxides as well, which does match or balance the two hydroxides in my product. I have one nickel, one nickel, and one sulfate, one sulfate. So that is a balanced chemical equation. We're still not done with part A though, because at this point with precipitation reactions, I need to use my solubility table to identify every single substance as being aqueous, that is water soluble or solid solid precipitate. Starting with KOH, you'll notice that hydroxides appear on the bottom half of our solubility table, that is the insoluble. So many hydroxides are insoluble precipitates for which we write a letter S in parentheses next to them to indicate that they are solids in water. However, there are some exceptions over here in the bottom right hand column. It says that hydroxides here are insoluble except for compounds containing NH4+, that's ammonium, group one metals, calcium, strontium, and barium. Now potassium, as it turns out, is a group one metal. So it is one of those exceptions, which means that KOH is not insoluble, which means that it is soluble. So we write AQ next to it, indicating that it will dissolve in water to form aqueous ions. Now what about nickel sulfate? Well, sulfate, as you'll see in the solubility table, is in the top half, the solubles. So all sulfates are soluble, as far as we care, except for strontium, barium, mercury, and lead sulfates. Nickel is not one of those exceptions, which means that it also is 
water soluble, so we write an AQ next to it. Now what about potassium sulfate? Based on what we just learned from sulfates, potassium sulfate will also be water soluble, so I write an AQ next to it. Now what of nickel hydroxide? Again, going to the hydroxides, being in the bottom half insoluble section of the table. All hydroxides are insoluble except for the exceptions written in the bottom right hand section, none of which are nickel. So nickel hydroxide is not an exception to the insolubles, which means that it will be insoluble. So we write next to it S to indicate that it is a solid insoluble precipitate. Now this complete ionic equation that I've written, as messy as it may be, is the answer to part A of our question, which takes us to part B. What precipitate forms? As we just saw, the precipitate is the nickel hydroxide solid. So that's the answer to part B. Now we're on to part C, which asks us in this situation, what is the limiting reactant? For that, we held back to limiting reactant concepts from an earlier chapter, linked to floating over my head or in the description below. Specifically, I'm gonna use my mnemonic BCD, where the letter B stands for balance the chemical equation. We're finished with that, so I'll put a check. The letter C stands for convert everything to moles. So let's go ahead and do that using dimensional analysis. For our KOH, we'll write it all out like this. You'll notice my milliliters cancel each other out. I've got liters here tied to milliliters. That will cancel out liters of solution. Now right here, I've got moles KOH per liters of solution. Where did I get that number? That's the capital M. Remember, that is what molarity is. It's moles of this substance per liters of that solution. You multiply all of this out and you'll see it comes to 0.02 moles of KOH. So I'm gonna replace this information right here with that number. Now let's do the same thing for nickel sulfate. Again, I have 200 milliliters of this nickel sulfate solution. I use this as a conversion to jump from milliliters to liters. And then I use my capital M, which is moles nickel sulfate per liter of this solution. Liters of solution cancel out liters up here. Milliliters cancel out milliliters right there. And I'm left with units of moles nickel sulfate. Plug and chug on your calculator and you'll see that this translates to 0.03 moles nickel sulfate. So I'm gonna replace these numbers with that one. We're now done with part C of our BCD process. So what is part D? It's divide each of these moles by their corresponding coefficients. The smallest answer is the limiting reactant. So here I've got 0.02 moles of KOH. So I'm gonna take the coefficient tied to the KOH, that's this two, and I'll divide the 0.02 by that two. That will give me 0.01. Over here I've got 0.03 moles nickel sulfate. There's no coefficient written here, so it's an understood or implied one. 0.03 divided by one is 0.03. Now, which of these two numbers right here, 0.01 or 0.03, is smallest? Yes, 0.01, which means that KOH is the limiting reactant, which is the answer to part C. That now takes us to part D. Determining the number of grams of our precipitate, which is this nickel hydroxide product, that form. Now, remember that all of the product amounts that form must come from the limiting reactant. So at this point, I don't really care about the nickel sulfate. I have to zoom in like a laser on the limiting reactant KOH. So how do I jump from 0.02 moles of KOH in this equation to grams of nickel hydroxide right there? By using dimensional analysis slash unit conversion. I've got dimensional analysis with moles KOH canceling out moles KOH in the basement, but what numbers do I put here? Those are the coefficients in the balanced equation for each of these substances. Moles KOH has a two next to it. What's the coefficient next to nickel hydroxide? Yeah, it's a one right there because each of these coefficients in a balanced equation really are mole to mole or molecule to molecule ratios. Now I've got moles nickel hydroxide here canceling out moles nickel hydroxide in the basement. What is this? This is the molecular weight, also called formula weight sometimes, of nickel hydroxide. Keeping in mind that nickel atoms weigh about 59, each oxygen weighs about 16, and there's two oxygens in this formula, and each hydrogen weighs one, and there are two such hydrogens. You multiply all that stuff out, you get an answer of 0.93 grams, which is our answer to part D.